Thank you everyone for joining. My name is Neil Simington. I work for the Groundwater Branch. And today I'm going to be presenting on how the Groundwater Branch integrate various geoscientific data in order to better understand and ultimately to characterise groundwater systems within the Australian context. This is a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to start by giving a little bit of a background into what a groundwater system characterisation is. I'm then going to give a reasonably quick definition of what I mean when I use the term data fusion. I'm going to follow that by introducing some of the key uh, geoscientific data sets which we use during our assessments. Then I'm going to give a number of examples of how we integrate and fuse these data in order to come up with better understanding of groundwater systems. Throughout the presentation, I'm going to introduce an, a couple of key concepts, which will be sort of recurring themes throughout. And I'm going to end by giving my ideas on some areas where I think we could probably improve in this space. OK, I can see quite a lot of my groundwater colleagues out there in the audience today. But for others who might not be so familiar with groundwater systems, I'm going to give a very brief background. Um, when I get asked in bars what groundwater is, I normally quite glibly reply that groundwater is water that is in the ground, which is <laughs> not particularly informative, but it's basically true. Groundwater is water that's stored within soils and within rocks, it's stored either within pores, so the little space in between grains, or in fractures in the rocks. Um, and groundwater uh, enters the system through a process called recharge, which we can see processes here, recharge coming into the groundwater from, in that case, rainwater, but it, it can also run in from rivers, uh, snowmelt, other sources. Um, once it's in the system, uh, water can go into what we call aquifers. These are geological units where water flows quite readily. Um, and within these systems, there's also aquitards like this. I'm going to use this terminology a bit. Aquitards are rock units where the water flows relatively slowly or not at all. Groundwater can vary enormously in age. Um, in the Great Artesian Basin, we have water that's up to 2 million years old. Um, and in contrast, uh, I visited Darwin this year where they have spill and fill aquifers. And the water is recharged almost every year. So the water in those systems would be in the order of years old. Likewise, water quality varies enormously. Uh, there's water that's so sweet that they sell it literally as spring water in bottles. There's water that is naturally so contaminated that it produ that's a very real public health issue. Um, arsenic within Bangladeshi groundwater is a very well-known example of that. And groundwater which is more salty than seawater. Most importantly, groundwater systems, although I'll be describing them in general, are just a, a single part of the larger hydraulic system. As you can see from this diagram, water, right? falls as rain, enters the system, recharges, it might flow between aquifers, it might flow back into wetlands or into rivers where it evaporates again, um, back into the atmosphere and falls back as rain. So if you are going to understand and manage the water system, it's absolutely essential that you understand and can characterise the groundwater system as well. A few more basics and really the aim of this slide is to get across just why it is so important that we do understand these systems. Groundwater makes up 50% of the global population's drinking water. Within Australia, it makes up one third of the water we use, and it's particularly important in a lot of drier communities, particularly cities like Perth and rural areas as well. Groundwater also sustains lots of ecosystems. So there's lots of vegetation and animal communities which are very heavily reliant on groundwater which either comes to the surface or is in the near surface. And a lot of the work that Geoscience Australia does is looking at assessing the impacts of potential developments on these ecosystems. Quite disturbingly, it's forecasted by 2050, more than 50% of the world's population will live under some kind of water stress. And a lot of that is due to depletion of some of our major aquifers because of unsustainable use. And we're seeing quite a lot, particularly in the news, about competing interests for water resources. This has been very prominent with uh, issues surrounding coal seam gas, the Adani coal mine, fish kills in Menindee. We're seeing that these water issues are becoming quite politically charged. Given that, it is, there is an absolute pressing need to better characterise these systems and to do so in political time frames so we can make, so we can give advice that can inform some of these important issues. This is the East Kimberley 
This is probably the Groundwater Branch's largest project as part of the EFTF, our Exploring for the Future. And here on the right are a list of the sorts of questions that we get asked by our stakeholders who are generally water managers. I'm not going to go through them each individually, but the take home message is in order for us to answer these range of questions, we need to build as holistic an understanding of the system as possible. This is perhaps the traditional or the consultant type approach to understanding groundwater systems. Groundwater sits underground, it's really quite hard to observe. I'll often now rely on very few data sets, maybe a handful of bores, maybe some remote sensing and some site observations, and they'll work that together with some understanding of groundwater processes, some experience on the behalf of the interpreters, and maybe some intuition as well, and come up with a very simple system conceptualization. And often, this simple conceptualization and this very small amount of data will be used to parameterize groundwater flow models. Groundwater flow models are a very important part of our decision making with regards to things like uh, new development. And they are they, they're mathematical representations of the groundwater system to simulate flow under particular conditions. Um, and as part of this, they, might, they will also develop some system knowledge so an understanding, conceptual understanding of the system, but it's often quite minor. In contrast, this is the, the approach that the Groundwater Branch of GA tries to take. We use quite a lot of different data sets, and I'm going to explore some of them today. There's still, of course, lots of expert input from people with experience and deep understanding of some of the processes, but we combine the data and our expert knowledge with a number of data fusion approaches, some of which I'll talk about today, to build a conceptual understanding of the system. So a sort of cartoon understanding of how the system may work. And from that and our data sets, we can not only parameterize groundwater models, and we help, we don't run simulate models ourselves, but we do inform groundwater modeling. But we also build up quite a comprehensive system knowledge, and we produce a number of customized products and it's these customized products that I'll be talking about today. So these are the four products which I'll be focusing on. We produce a lot of different products, a lot of different data sets, but for brevity, I'm gonna focus on these four because I think they are the most important. And most of all, they are the ones which are really interested in dealing with the subsurface, which is one of the great challenges with characterizing groundwater. These products are hydrostratigraphy. So you might be familiar with stratigraphy, which is a, a mappable rock unit. Um, hydrostratigraphy refers to a mappable unit, but you map it based on its hydraulic properties. So whether it behaves, say, as an aquifer or as an aquitard. Once we've def defined these hydrostratigraphy, we also want to define what the properties are. And I'll explore this a bit more, but the properties are very important for parameterizing groundwater flow models. Likewise, we want to be able to model in 3D groundwater quality. So within these units, where do we have fresh water? Where do we have saline water? And finally, we want to be able to define a water table surface. That is, at any particular point, how deep is it to the water table? And these are the four products I'm going to be exploring today. I'm now going to try and give a bit of an explanation of my understanding of data fusion, or how I, I use it for the work that I do, because I know it is a term that's got different meanings in different fields. Um, I looked up a technical definition, and the best one I could find is as so. Data fusion techniques combine data from multiple sensors and related information from associated databases to achieve improved accuracy and more specific inferences than could be achieved by the use of a single sensor alone. I know this is very technical, but essentially, if you have more data sets which are trying to image or give information on a particular part of the system, you're going to get a, a less uncertain picture of it. Now, I'm going to try to give an intuitive example of this, um, something that might make sense to the more general audience. Um, this is something that has actually happened to me. Um, imagine that you're driving a field vehicle out in, out in the field somewhere, say the East Kimberley, it's hot, it's dry, it's dusty, it might be a few hours from the nearest town, and you drive into a rut. I'm not a very good driver, these things happen. And you want to, you ask yourself then, is this field vehicle safe to continue driving, or do I have to take it back to town? Um, to make that assessment, you decide to collect some data. You might hop out of the car and have a look on the dash if there's any warning lights, have a look at the tires, see if it appears that they're all still pumped up and there's no major damage to the chassis. 
Um, you might pop the, the bonnet open and have a bit of a look. There might be some fluid in the engine, but it doesn't have that sort of strong, I think coolant sort of smells like Chinese food. It doesn't have that strong scent to it. So you think maybe it's just water from the air conditioner or something along those lines. Um, so you decide to go back and try to turn the car on and still sounds like it's okay. So you, you drive it for a few hundred meters slowly and you sort of start to feel that the, the steering isn't quite right. So you have another look and yeah, one of the wheels looks like it may have been uh, knocked out of alignment. And so you make the decision that probably it's a good idea to take it back to a mechanic. Now, anyone who is more mechanically minded in the audience, which is probably than I, which is probably most of you, might be shaking your head at this example. But I think it shows how us humans naturally use data fusion um, in making everyday decisions. In this case, we're using data from our eyes, from our ears, um, from our nose, sense of smell, and our touch, or sort of tactile sensation, to diagnose an issue with the car and then make a decision based on that um, information to return back to town. Okay, I'm now going to start talking about some of these key da data sets. I'm going to start with borehole data. Borehole data are our most important data sets. They are practically the only way that we can directly observe what is in the subsurface, where the groundwater is that we're interested in studying. This is a map of the bores that we have reasonably detailed information on for the East Kimberley. And at those sites, we have a reasonably high amount of data. This is one of the strata logs for one of our bores. And this bore is 45 meters deep. And so what we do, this is using a technique called sonic, we'll drill a hole and pull up a lot of the material from that hole. And on that material, we can start making observations. We can do measurements on things like grain size, describe the lithology or what type of material it is. Once the material is out of the hole, we complete the bore with PVC, but at this, we call this a screened interval here, we'll put a bit of mesh which will allow water to enter the bore. And once water is in the bore, we can sample it for chemistry. So try to understand things like quality or um, whatever else the chemistry may tell us about processes. Likewise, the water will rise to a level in the bore based on the pressure in the aquifer. We can measure this to get water, the depth to water table. And we can displace water or add water to the system and then measure the change uh, or the recovery within the bore and use that to make inferences about the properties of the aquifer around the bore. Likewise, we can also put geophysical tools down these bores. Uh, the main ones that we use in groundwater assessments are induction logs, where we'll put a tool down that uses electromagnetics to estimate the electrical conductivity, so how readily the material will, can conduct electricity. We also put a gamma tool down looking at uh, gamma counts, so how, how much, which is a proxy for how much clay content there is in the material. And we also use borehole NMR, which uses the NMR response in hydrogen atoms within water molecules to give us an estimate of water content, which is stated set here. As you can imagine, that's very important for understanding aquifer properties. Now we have this huge amount of data, I haven't even covered them all, at our boreholes. And we can get very good understanding for these particular areas. But if you consider the size of a bore, might be sort of that big, maybe your geophysical tools are seeing out that big, and you consider how much, how many bores you have, this is 40 bores is quite a lot, really. Um, but compare that to the, the volume that you're seeing from the bore to the volume of the entire East Kimberley, you're really getting a very, very small insight into the system. And this is particularly important in groundwater studies because groundwater properties are extremely variable. Um, to illustrate this, within an alluvial system, so an old river system or an old river aquifer, you, you can get sands and clays next to each other. You can, those, the hydraulic conductivity, so how readily that material allows water to flow through it, can vary nine orders of magnitude. Nine orders of magnitude is greater than the distance difference in speed of me walking across this stage and the speed of light. So the hydraulic properties in a very short space of very sp short distance can vary absolutely enormous, enormously. Clearly, we need methods to be able to understand what's happening between the bores and not just make assumptions. The data set that we have, that we acquire most readily um, to help us achieve this is airborne electromagnetics. Airborne EM is an airborne geophysical technique. We fly it on a, a helicopter or a plane like this and what you are 
able to get is data which can allow you to estimate the electrical properties of the subsurface. So this is the typical data we get. This is a, a vertical section along a flight path, and we get conductivity from red, reasonably conductive, and blue, which is reasonably resistive. And from this broad acre mapping, what we can do with airborne electromagnetics, we can make some inferences about what is in the subsurface. But it's not always simple. Uh, electrical conductivity is not the property that we're interested in. And it, it's dependent on a number of different things, including salinity, clay content, porosity, saturation, tortuosity, and mineralization. Some of those are very important for us to know for characterizing these systems. But the relationships between our conductivity and the properties we're interested in are often nonlinear. And so we need to combine other data sets. I've included this as a 3D visualization of our Airborne EM data because I think it really illustrates nicely how Airborne EM can be used to give you a very good overall picture. Here we have in the blue a big resistive sandstone unit. We know it's sandstone from other data sets and we might think this is prospective for groundwater because it's very resistive. On the flip side up here in the coastal zone we have red colors indicating high conductivity. We might immediately suspect that there might be some influence of seawater. So for a, a technique that you can relatively cheaply acquire, you can get a lot of information very quickly out of it. Now, here's the first of our key concepts, geophysical inversion. The data that you get from a lot of geophysical techniques, and particularly airborne EM, is not actually the, the property, geophysical property that you're interested in. Airborne EM measures not electrical conductivity, but time varying magnetic field. And so what you want to do is you want to be able to get a model of conductivity. And to do that, you have to use a method called geophysical inversion. Now, if you understand the governing equations and the instrumentation and the acquisition parameters, you can get a, a model of the subsurface and find out what the data would look like. Right, and that's called the forward problem. You calculate your data from your model. But you can already probably see what the problem is with that. We don't know the model, we want to know the, the model. What we know is the data. So we have to run the inverse of this, where we try to predict the model from the data. And to do this, we run geophysical inversion, where we'll try many, many, many different models, run the forward problem, until we get data which adequately fits the data that came off the, the helicopter or whatever geophysical technique you use. Now, one issue with geophysical inversion is mathematically, there is not one model that can fit your data uniquely there are infinitely many models. And so we will often work on one, but there are others that could equally do the job, and we have to keep this in mind when we are interpreting it, and um, I'll, this will be discussed a little bit further throughout the presentation. The next data set I'm going to talk about is surface nuclear magnetic resonance. This is a ground-based electrical technique. So we go out into the field, uh, lay wires out in a loop, and we run large currents through that loop, and we measure the NMR response within the hydrogen nuclei uh, within water molecules. And then we run a geophysical inversion to produce a one-dimensional water content profile. So here we have on the y-axis depth, so zero to about 100 meters. That's about the depth of investigation for this technique. And on the x-axis, we have water content. So for this particular site, we have a reasonably good quality aquifer at about 80 meters depth, maybe another one of reasonable quality below about 35 or so. And then perhaps up here, we might be looking at our unsaturated zone where you are sitting above your water table. This technique, I think, is a real game changer because it is so fast to acquire. We can do a site in about two or three hours, and it's non-invasive. So we don't have to get approvals. We don't have to go through the costly, difficult process of uh, so using techniques like borehole drilling where you have to uh, clear the land and all that sort of jazz. So it means that while your borehole data is often very sparse, you can quite easily go into the, the areas where you, you have high model uncertainty because of sparse data and acquire SNMR, which you can estimate the properties, water content, that are very, very important for these groundwater assessments. Just to highlight this, here's a map, and I've included these blue points from the previous slide are our borehole locations, and these marine points are our surface NMR sites. So we can acquire a lot of data, really, and particularly in areas where we may not otherwise have good information. Now, we acquire a lot of other data sets. I'm going to go through these other ones reasonably quickly, just for sake of brevity. 
Um, we acquire, acquire other geophysics, for example, seismic and magnetics, to tell us about the, velocity, uh, prop the velocities of the subsurface and the magnetic properties as well. Likewise, we acquire a lot of remote sensing data. Digital elevation model is an essential data set for us, which is a high resolution elevation map across our project area. And we also are able to access high temporal resolution surface reflectance data from satellites. Shout out to any Digital Earth Australia colleagues here. It's very easy for us to access Landsat data, which gives us images of the surface at maybe something like every 10 or 20 days or so, depending on when it is. So that data set is very, very accessible, which makes it very useful for us. Um, I've also included a lot of our field observations. So these are data that we acquire by people actually going out and visiting these field areas. So it might be some of our scientists going out and mapping geology, mapping geomorphic features, um, so, landscape features which uh, may relate to something in the subsurface. Mapping structure, for example, here's a picture of my colleague Chris in a dipping bed. You can use that, those surface measurements to make inferences about what's happening in the subsurface. Um, likewise, we're always interested in any observation of groundwater discharging at the surface. It tells us about some groundwater processes or vegetation can also uh, be used to infer where you may have shallow water tables. So, I can't I'm not going to go through every data set that we acquire, but we use all of these and many more, and we, as best as we can, try to integrate them to build up more of an understanding of the system and to be able to produce a bunch of the customised products, which I'm going to talk about. The second key concept um, I'm going to introduce today is spatial modelling. The spatial modelling, quite simply, is predicting variables or values at locations where you don't have any direct observations. The most intuitive example I could come up with was weather forecasting. I looked up the temperature at Bungendore, which is about half an hour down the road, and it told me it was 13 degrees Celsius, but Bungendore doesn't have a weather station. The nearest weather station is Cohen Forest, 12.3 kilometres away. So the Bureau of Meteorology are using a model to tell me what the temperature is at a location where they don't have any data. In this case, it's probably a very simple model. It's probably a nearest neighbour, they're probably just assuming that the temperature is the same as what it is at Cohen Forest. But nonetheless, they employ these sort of spatial modelling techniques very frequently. Likewise do we. We have, as I've mentioned, very high resolution data at our boreholes. At those boreholes, we can build up quite a good understanding of what's going on in the system, at least at those points. And then we can look at using our other more extensive data sets, like Airborne EM, to interpolate our understanding away and fill in those gaps between the boards. And you can do this in a number of ways, and I'll cover some of them. You can look at, use your understanding of physical processes or the mathematical structure of the data using techniques like geostatistics. Um, or you can look at building empirical relationships between what you know at the ball and what you and your more spatially extensive data sets. Now I'll, I'll talk about this. This will be a bit of a recurring theme throughout. I'm now going to give some examples of how these data sets are used in deriving some of our customised products, which ultimately contain a lot of our understanding of the system. I'm going to start by talking about hydrostratigraphy. As I've mentioned, hydrostratigraphy are mappable units based on hydraulic properties like hydraulic conductivity. So an aquifer could be considered as a hydrostratigraphic unit. This image here is a horizontal slice. So imagine a 3D model and you've taken a horizontal slice through it and it has mapped here a number of our different hydrostratigraphy which are described in this legend here. This process is, in my opinion, the most difficult thing we do. All of our geoscientific data goes into it, all of our borehole data, M1EM, SNMI, everything I've mentioned. Um, but often those data alone aren't enough to fully describe it, so we rely a lot on interpreters like KP, like Dave Gibson from our team and many others, uh, to use their experience and their understanding of groundwater systems to build a hydrostratigraphic model which is not only consistent with the data sets that we have, but also consistent with our conceptualisation of how, groundwater system, how this groundwater system um, is. And it's still a very manual task. It still involves a lot of, a lot of putting dots and lines on maps, um, but it is crucially important to get this right, um, because this model feeds so many of the downstream products which I'm going to talk about. The next product I'm going to describe are uh, aquifer properties, and we map this in three dimensions within our various hydrostratigraphic units. 
Hydraulic conductivity, as I've mentioned, is a very, very important property. That is how readily water can flow through aquifer or subsurface material. And it's an absolutely critical input into groundwater flow modeling. So being able to provide advice on this to our stakeholders is very much valued by them because it helps them really constrain their flow models, which are often very poorly constrained if they're purely relying on data from boreholes. Traditionally, we measure hydraulic conductivity using laboratory testing. This involves running water through core material that you've taken from a borehole or borehole testing. As I've mentioned, displacing or adding water to a system and then measuring the time that it takes to return or to recover back to its equilibrium and using that to make inferences about this property. However, increasingly, because we need the issue with that is we only have limited borehole data and it's often sparse over large parts of our project areas. We're looking to employ NMR techniques, particularly SNMR, in order to estimate hydraulic conductivity so we can map it in three dimensions. To do this, we use this empirical equation, Schlumberger-Dole, where hydraulic conductivity is calculated using T2 star and effective porosity. Both of these terms are outputs of the SNMR inversion. This value C is a formation dependent constant. So we derive it for each hydrostratigraphic unit. And to do this, we use an optimization routine where we try to minimize the error between the K that we measure at boreholes using Sligo pump tests and this value here by varying that value of C to minimize the misfit between those two estimates. So once we have estimates of C for particular formations, we are able to estimate hydraulic conductivity throughout our area where we have surface NMR. If you consider this area where we've got surface NMR and borehole in red, borehole in blue, we suddenly have quite a lot of points. In order to model the properties we're interested in, as I've mentioned, hydraulic conductivity, this map is showing transmissivity, which is conductivity multiplied by the thickness of the aquifer. We can use a number of approaches. Here, we just use standard interpolation, creaking. We use the structure of the data. We can do that here readily because we have quite detailed, we have quite dense SNMR. But an alternative approach is to derive an empirical mapping function where you can calculate <coughs> hydraulic conductivity K from your airborne EM. So here's a scatter plot where I'm investigating a relationship, log bulk conductivity on the x-axis, log hydraulic conductivity, and there's a little bit of a relationship there, maybe. Not enough for us to map, we decided to use interpolation. But this has been done in areas where you have relatively homogeneous aquifers or perhaps very homogeneous water quality. To summarize our method for modeling aquifer properties, we have borehole estimates of K and we use co-located SNMR to calculate an optimal value of C. So we can then calculate hydraulic conductivity at every SNMR site. And then we use spatial modeling in the case I've given interpolation, but we also may use an empirical function to model aquifer properties in 3D. The next product which I'm going to describe is groundwater quality. Groundwater quality is very important to our stakeholders, water managers. They want to know, if they ask questions like, what's the volume of the fresh resource? Or where do we have a salinity hazard? In order to answer these questions, we want to know, basically have three new models of, of what the groundwater quality is in, in the system. Similar story, we measure groundwater quality at bores. Here's one of our field staff getting a a sample from one of our artesian bores. So sample it from the bore, from the screen interval, or from the pore fluid. So when you pull up the material, you can extract the fluid from the core and run chemistry on that. And from that data set, we have estimates of water quality. But we want to map it in three dimensions. And we only have, as I've said, sparse borehole data. Once again, there is an equation for calculating this. This is one way. The equation is called Archie's law, and it relates groundwater electrical conductivity, which is our proxy for quality. So imagine this is your groundwater quality, um, and it's a function of your rock, fluid saturated rock conductivity. So imagine that as, or that's the data you can get either from your airborne EM, which gives you bulk conductivity estimates, or from your induction logs. It's also a function of effective porosity, which we can likewise get from our SNMR and grid onto a 3D mesh. And we also have this M term, a cementation exponent, so how cemented the rock is. And 
we can estimate this at boreholes where we do actually have some measurements of the groundwater quality. So once we have all of these terms, we can put them together in order to solve for groundwater conductivity. So to take you through that, this is a map of mapped or gridded bulk conductivity for our Cenozoic aquifer. So red is highly conductive up near the estuary, blue resistive. We also have a map of, in this case, gridded porosity from our SNMR. We have high porosity here in blue, lower here in green. And when you plug those into the equation with your cementation exponent, uh, you can get this map of water quality, which in this case we have transformed to TDS, which is total dissolved solids, or a measure of how much salt you have within groundwater. So Archie's law is one way of calculating groundwater onto a three degree. The other way, similar to aquifer properties, is deriving an empirical function, where you're relating your groundwater quality to your airborne air. This is actually from our Keep River data set, and you can see there is quite a good linear relationship here. So we can derive this function, completely empirical. It only holds true for the area in which we did this work and where we took these samples. And you can use this in order to map in three dimensions where you have airborne EM data. This approach is valid when you have relatively homogeneous systems, sandy aquifer where you don't have much variation in porosity or clay size and the whole thing saturated. Um, then you can use an empirical approach like this. And in our Keep River project, which we've been working on very recently, this approach actually gave us more accurate estimates of water quality compared to what we got from Archie's law. So a number of ways of doing it. Um, some will be valid in some circumstances, others in others. To summarise, once again, we have high resolution borehole data and we can use this to estimate M within Archie's law. Once we have solved that M estimate for the various hydrostratigraphic units, we can plug it into the equation and we can solve for groundwater quality on a 3D grid, so long as we have bulk AM conductivity and a effective porosity grid as well, which we get from our airborne EM and SNMR data sets respectively. So we're starting to combine these data sets to map away from our boreholes using spatial modeling techniques into 3D. Alternatively, we can derive empirical functions um, if our uh, work suggests that that's valid based on the uh, internal data relationships. The final product I'm going to describe today is mapping water tables. So water tables are defined as the surface, a water table is the surface below which all of the pores and fractures in the groundwater system are fully saturated. And that's within an unconfined aquifer. So an aquifer which is in connection with the atmosphere. If you imagine your village well, and you put a pail down there and you hear it go pop and you pull up water, that's the intersection with the water level in that well, that is your depth to water table. And we can measure that at bores using a similar technique um, to a very high degree of accuracy. Uh, traditional methods have used these point estimates of water table depth um, and may make contour maps based on them. So you say, okay, we've got eight meters uh, standing water level, so depth to water table here, 10, 12 meters here. I'm gonna put a contour here and then you may not have some information so the hydrogeologist might sort of put something that makes most sense to them which is fairly qualitative, um, not very repeatable. Um, more recently, approaches like interpolation, kriging, um, from these points are becoming more common. Um, but it's worth mentioning again, borehole measurements often very, very sparse and clustered. If we want to reduce our model uncertainty where we have very little information, we have to look for other data sets. And this is where SNMR really comes into its own. Um, it's, as I mentioned, it gives you estimates of water content as a function of depth, which is extremely informative for trying to pick your saturated and unsaturated zones. But there's no published method for this in the literature. So we came up with our own approach where we used machine learning and optimization to estimate the water table depth from our SNMR inversions. And this used co-located boreholes. So we had boreholes and SNMR at the same site we learned the relationship between whether an interval was unsaturated as it is up here or saturated, learned the relationship between inversion and interpretation, and then applied that algorithm more widely on all of our sites. And we got quite good results from this model. Our accuracy of predicting saturation was about 95% for our training data set, and our error of predicting when we used the optimization to pick the best water table was about one meter, so quite 
good uh, predictive accuracy from these models. Following this process, we had water table estimates at boreholes and at SNMR sites. So quite a lot of information. So once we had those estimates at not only boreholes, but also SNMR sites, we looked to employ spatial predictive modeling to try to find those onto a grid. In this case, we used strong relationships with our elevation data and our airborne EM to build a model to predict water table across on our grid. And our interpreters much preferred the model that we came up with um, compared to what we would have come up with the traditional approach. Uh, because it was more in line with their expectations and understandings of the system. So this image on the left is what we would have achieved if we'd used traditional creaking approaches from our standing water levels. And this one here on the right is employing all of the SNMR data and as well as the standing water levels, as well as our gridded products to produce this surface, which is more hydrogeologically re realistic given our understanding of the system. I think we do a really good job here at in the groundwater branch at um, bringing together so much information and producing knowledge out of it. Uh, but of course, there's always improvements that we can make. Um, a lot of the workflows I've described are what is in the data fusion literature described as post-inversion integration. Um, so taking inversions from Airborne EM, taking inversions from SNMR, interpretations from boreholes, and sort of shaking them together using some of these approaches to come up with uh, some sort of system knowledge and to derive the products which I've described. Um, but there are, there are certainly problems with that. As I've described with geophysical inversion, you have the issue of non-uniqueness. So although we are mapping, we are using, say, a single airborne EM inversion and assuming plus or minus that it's correct, of course, there's many other models which we could use. So I think we would really benefit from more seamless iteration between the interpreters on individual data sets and the synthesis of those data sets to produce products. And this is something that I see quite a lot in the data fusion literature with a lot of these data fusion engines. So that's something I think we could do a lot more. I would also like to see us use our data more to test hypotheses. I think we're still very much uh, in the habit of getting our data and using it to build towards our best model. When realistically, there's many models, many conceptual models, many, many physical models, that can fit our data, um, but I think we'd really benefit from taking the data sets and querying them in a way that we can falsify some of those and then end up with ideally one model, but possibly a number which are consistent. Um, it requires a slightly different way of thinking, but it's more consistent with the scientific method. And finally, as all scientists who work um, to inform policy and decision making. I think we have to do a better job of understanding our uncertainty, estimating it and propagating it through to our advice. For example, this is a water table map which we gave to our stakeholders and they probably assume that it's our best effort and probably something close to right to say, okay, at this point we're giving a particular water table depth, say five metres, and say that's our best estimate. But what I would like for us to do is to try propagate our uncertainty throughout the whole modelling process and maybe be able to provide advice like the probability that the water table at this point is less than five metres is 50% or whatever it might be. I think that's a, a more honest um, way of providing advice, um, but it does require a slightly different way of thinking and it's not necessarily always simple to do. Okay, that's my presentation. I'll quickly summarise it. Um, even if you don't believe a word I've said, please, the take home message is that it is extremely important, particularly in our current climate of competing interests on water resources and uh, models of future scarcity, to understand groundwater systems as part of responsible management of the whole water system. Groundwater systems are very complex. There's lots of drivers. Properties are extremely variable. We only have relatively limited data that informs us about them and no single data set can answer the range of questions that we are being asked. But what we try to do, and I hope I've communicated to you today, is exploit mutual information from our different data, data sets and bring them together to better understand the system and produce products and models which are, hopefully have lower uncertainties associated with them. Just a final word. This is in the interest of transparent science. A lot of the workflows I've presented today are published in my GitHub repository, or working version of. 
So if you want to go and have a look, and please do, and eventually when the data comes out, you can even run them yourself. Um, please feel free to do so. And thank you for listening. I'm, of course, happy to answer any questions now, but I'm also happy to stay around afterwards and talk at greater length with anyone who wants to. So thank you.